All right, now we're discussing international management. The concepts are <clears throat> from the Robbins Coulter textbook, but they're fairly universal and are probably going to be found in most principles of management book and organizational textbook. My name is Mike Knudstrup, all right, and I've been teaching manage various management and management topics for about 15 years now, I currently teach at beautiful Florida Southern College in Central Florida. Let's start off, you know, what are some good reasons to consider an international assignment? You know, and there are a lot of good reasons. One, oftentimes, the pay is higher when you work on an international assignment. Sometimes you can get interesting and uh, challenging responsibilities. In a lot of companies, if you want to move up, you know, multinational companies, let's say Coca-Cola, IBM, or whatever, you almost have to have some kind of international assignments. And it also looks very good on a resume. Myself, I have uh, I've worked in the Middle East for a couple of years, but it really all started back when I was an undergrad when I did a, a three-month study in, in France, and that kind of got me used to the idea of working internationally. All right, so we're going to discuss uh, different approaches to international management, the uh, <clears throat> phases that uh, companies go when going international, the regional trading blocks. Um, we'll also discuss a few economic, financial, and political factors, and we'll also discuss Hofstede's uh, <clears throat> dimensions of international culture. But there are different perspectives you can take when going on an international assignment. One is the ethnocentric attitude. My way is best. Well, that's just what guy might be saying. All right. We acknowledge an ethnocentric uh, approach. A person acknowledges that there are other ways to do it, but they just feel that their way is the best. The polycentric way of management would allow the host country to decide how to do things. A geocentric attitude would take the best practices from around the world and implement them. You know, say maybe American marketing and German engineering. We try to put them together to have the best company that we can possibly be. You know, and you might say all, all people, I believe, start have a certain amount of ethnocentrism. You know, their, their ethnicity or their group is best. But through contact and maybe experiences with other cultures, we can we can work that through that and see that uh, you know most, if not all, cultures have something uh, something to give or something to learn from. All right. <clears throat> Internationally speaking, the the nations seem to align themselves with regional trading blocks. All right, we're probably all familiar with the European Union. Uh, you know. Countries such as Germany, France, Spain, um, and other various countries belong to the European Union. NAFTA, what is NAFTA? The North American Free Trade Agreement. The Asian countries are part of ASEAN, and the South American are part of MERCOSUR. So why, why, do, why do countries get involved in these trading blocks? Well, one, there's often reduced barriers to, to cross-border cross interaction. You're allowed to ship things and sell things across border much more, across borders much more easily. It used to be, for example, in Europe, every time you crossed the border, all right, you needed, uh, you needed to get your passport stamped, okay, or there was, there was some kind of border, border patrol, and now there's a free trade, there's free passage of people as well. You know, so hopefully one country can, uh, one country can specialize in whatever it's good at. And vice versa, they'll trade with another country that's better than something else. Better win something else. Comparative advantage. They also reduce, uh, reduce the amount of, amount of tariffs. And in the European Union, they have a common currency, which is known as the euro. All right. Uh, some would say the trading blocks are, are part of what would, we might say countervailing power. You know, the United States being a very large economy, a lot of people, the other nations might feel the need 
to get together and to cooperate in order to countervail all the power of a large economy such as such as the United States. On a uh, worldwide level, we have the World Trade Organization, which promotes uh, global trade uh, among members around the world. And again, it tries to reduce tariffs uh, and uh, difficulties uh, between cross-border trading. Came from uh, GATT, General Agreement of Tariffs and Trade, uh, way back in the 1940s. And the result in is in the last 70 years or so, tariffs have fallen from 40% to 4%. All right, if you don't, a tariff is basically a tax on uh, on goods that cross borders. So tariffs have fallen from 40 to uh, 4% in about the uh, the last 70 years, and a lot of people give credit to GATT and the World Trade Organization. Also, a World Trade Organization tries to re reduce things uh, like counterfeiting and piracy. All right, if you've ever been to uh, Barry's on your location, but I know in my travels uh, around the world, I've been to various places where there'll be bootleg DVDs, CDDs, and that kind of thing. And uh, WTO tries to stop that. You know, we want to protect the, the copyright holders so that they can be rewarded for their efforts. All right, even with all this, countries go global in stages. Okay, and so when you look at these, think about what's different. What's the pattern here? Well, first stage might be import, import, export, and then as things are going better, maybe they hire some foreign representation in that country. Say uh, Walmart, you know, maybe when they when they started, uh, were tentative in their importing and exporting, and after they got they got <clears throat> established or found that a company's country's goods were very useful, they hired foreign representatives, such as in China. And stage three is licensing and franchising. All right, licensing being more for products, and franchising being more for services. So maybe we can think of uh, all some products that might be licensed. Oh, maybe like your favorite sports team, who knows, Manchester United or whatever, they license their products to be made in other countries. And franchising, oh, maybe one of the most famous franchises might be Mickey D's, McDonald's. Uh, com country, companies might also get together in, in joint ventures. All right, where two country companies get together, say like Toyota and GM, to produce a special car. Foreign subsidiaries are outright owned in the other country. All right, so what do you see here in the stages? What's the pattern in these stages? Well, I would say that the main pattern is the level of investment. Hope you can read my writing there. I know I could do a little better. The amount of investment and the amount of risk. Yeah, this is very, very simple. Import exporting and foreign subsidiaries are very risky and much more complicated. You know, in some countries around the world where their governments aren't stable, government changes hands or the government needs in income, and so uh, they look to foreign co companies and they may even expropriate them. They might take the foreign country's assets, like, uh, for example, in uh, Argentina recently, there's been some current some concern about them taking over a Spanish oil company. Okay, so organizations go global in stages. Stage one being very simple, stage three being uh, very complex. The legal environment in business obviously differs, as I just mentioned previously. Some countries have legal, most all com com countries have legal procedures, but they're not always implemented. All right, and so the amount of political risk is important to multinational countries. Uh, <clears throat> if there's a lot of political risk there, then 
then they're going to try to do things to uh, compensate or they're going to want to get a greater return. You know, fair and honest elections or democracies tend to have uh, less political risk than others. You know, here in the United States, all right, we have a very stable political system and investors tend to flock to the United States from around the world investing in our stock market uh, or holding uh, our, our dollar as a, as a hedge or an investment due to the, the confidence in our economy, for example. Sometimes, as I mentioned, in other countries, you know, the political risk is high and there's a lot of concern that laws are not applied equally, you know, or fairly, or that their <clears throat> that, oh, that their assets might even be seized by the local government. Economic systems, there are two major economic systems. One is a market economy. The other is a command economy. Command economy is where a few decision makers at the top make the decisions about what's being produced or what people can have. There are fewer and fewer purely uh, command economies. Maybe you can think of a few right now. Uh, one might be Cuba, you know, another might be North Korea, all right, um, and these are <clears throat> these are where a few decision makers, decision makers at the top, decide, you know, what is going to be produced and in what quantities. In the market economy, it's so that's so that's top down. In the market economy, is more bottom up. This is where the consumers make the decisions on what's going to be purchased and bought. We might say uh, a command economy is top down, a market economy is, is bottom up. Command economies tend to suffer from a misallocation of resources. As a few, de as a few decision makers you know, maybe won't make the best decisions. Market economies, you know, kind of suffer from booms and busts as consumers move from periods of fear to greed. Quite honestly, you know, the, the stops, uh, the brakes aren't there to the same degree that there might be in a command economy yeah, as there is in a market, you know, market economy. So booms and busts are a problem in a market economy probably even more so than a command economy. Some monetary and financial factors, one being currency exchange rates and exchange rate risk. All right, so is it better if you're a multinational corporation, corporation MNC, to hold uh, currency in a, uh, in a, hold currency in a country where it's being uh, depreciated or appreciated, all right? If you said appreciation is better, you are right. It's better to hold currencies that are appreciating. For example, versus the dollar in the last 10 years, the euro has done quite well. So if you're a multinational company, <clears throat> you would have been in good stead if you have held euros over dollars. You know, the exchange rate, well, they vary, but when the euro first came out over 10 years ago, you could buy euro with less than $1 US. You know, it's varied recently from anywhere from $1.40 or so to purchase one euro. All right. Inflation rates also affect multinational companies. In some places, their large inflation is very high. You know, what costs ten dollars this year costs twenty dollars the next. And thus, since your money is becoming less and less valuable, savings goes down as inflation goes up. And inflation creates a disincentive. Oh, I know you can't read that probably as well as I'd like, but as you look at it closely, all right, maybe it'll help you to uh to remember, inflation creates a disincentive to save. Company, companies also find themselves facing diverse tax policies in various areas of the world. You know, tax havens. 
are a lot of different tax havens around the world. The United States, the tax rate is, the top tax rate, I believe, is something like 36%. There are places, other places in the world where the tax rate is as low as 2% or so. You know, and corporations being profit maximizers, they try to show more income in these income tax havens. Whether or not they do a lot of business or there or not, you know, they're at least going to have some kind of P.O. box where they show more income or as much income as they possibly can. Some of the Caribbean nations, for example, have very low tax rates, uh, <clears throat> Bermuda, Cayman Islands, and that kind of thing. And corporations try to shift their income or the money that they show to these lower tax rate places. All right, finally, I want to talk about the cross-cultural differences. Uh, in terms of personality, maybe the most common one is individualism and collectivism. And that is a, a focus more so, uh, what's the focus on, the individual or the group? Okay. Um, the U.S. would fall where? The U.S. tends to be one of the more individualistic countries. Okay. Uh, collectivistic countries, to L1, for example, might be Japan or China. Say, for example, you were with a group of friends and you were thinking about a movie to see, an individualistic culture, it might be seen as okay if you decide, hey guys, I don't like this movie, I'm not going. In a collectivistic culture, they're going to say, you're going to feel compelled maybe to go along with the group. But collective, in individualistic cultures, people tend to move around. The ties that bind are much weaker. In a collectivistic culture, you might have family or friend, you might have lifelong friends, and the ties that bind are pretty, uh, pretty strong. Power distance is the perceived distance between authority figure and a subordinate. <clears throat> if there's a large distance perceived between me and a boss, then, um, you know, might be a boss with capitals. You know, I defer, I respect that boss a lot. I'm careful how I speak with her, him or her. All right. If there's a low power distance, there's a le lesser perceived difference between the boss and I, lesser status. We're going to be a lot more informal and um, maybe even be on a first name basis. Uncertainty avoidance is a toleration of risk and a preference for structure. If you get high uncertainty avoidance, you're concerned about what's going to happen in the future. You might want a lot of structure and you might be concerned with risk. I know one way, for example, that we have people who uh, have their planner books and uh, Perhaps you have friends where if you want to meet with them in a couple of weeks, they have to put you in their planner. A planner book, I believe, is one way of reducing uncertainty in your life. And so a person high in uncertainty avoidance, <coughs> well, might use a planner book. Or they might just like to be real organized, but you never know. All right. Quality versus quantity of life. Okay. <clears throat> quantity uh People who are interested in a high quantity of life, you like to live large. You have a lot of material things. People who are, who are interested in quality of life maybe value relationships a bit more. All right. In the United States, we do value quantity. You know, we have big hamburgers. We have big houses. Well, that's not going to be the best. Place, but we have big houses. We have big cars. We like to live large. We're in a sin quantity of life. Maybe a Scandinavian country and uh, maybe would have smaller, smaller material issues, but maybe would live a little slower pace and value relationships a little bit more. <clears throat>